Today we'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1 in our uh, look at the doxologies of the New Testament. You'll remember we're looking at all 17 of them. And so we've moved on from Romans. We looked at four in the epistle to the Romans. Now we're looking at Galatians. So just open your Bible to uh, Galatians chapter 1. And I'll read from verse 1 uh, to verse 5. The doxology is actually found in verse 5. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me under the churches or the assemblies of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world or out of this present evil age according to the will of God and our Father. Now here's the doxology. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, one of the striking things right off the bat here is that the doxology become, uh, appears at the, almost at the very beginning of the epistle. Whereas most of the other doxologies that we'll find are uh, more towards the middle or the end of, of, of uh, an epistle. Well, into the the doctrine that one of the apostles is trying to present to us, just generally speaking, not 100% all the time, uh, but uh, generally speaking. But here in Galatians, right up front, right at the beginning, right in the, actually, in the introduction, let's put it that way, the very opening of the epistle, uh, we get this doxology. Now, Galatians, uh, the epistle of Galatians, of course, has a, a particular uh, uh, character and emphasis uh, it's a defense of the gospel of the grace of God. In some ways, it's similar to the epistle to the Romans, uh, in that many of Paul's arguments are, are pretty well the same. You know, justification by faith, the death and resurrection of Christ, looking at the promises from the Old Testament, from Abraham and so on, uh, to uh, show the, the truth of the gospel of Christ. So there's these similarities. But there's a striking difference. In the epistle to the Romans, Paul's laying down the foundation uh, of what the uh, gospel is. It's sort of a manifesto, uh, a positive declaration of what the gospel is. Whereas Galatians is really a defense of the gospel when it has been under attack. And it's striking, you know, with the Apostle Paul's ministry, that he would go from town to town throughout uh, the ancient Middle East of the first century. He preached the gospel perhaps in a synagogue and some of the God-fearing Gentiles would hear and and then uh, an assembly would be formed. Uh, he would teach them for several weeks or months and then he would leave town. And then behind him would come in uh, Judaizers who would try to uh, bring the Christians, the believers, under some um, legal principle. Uh, just like the Lord Jesus said that the Son of Man sowed the seed and uh, of the good seed of the Word of God, the, the wheat or the grain, and then the enemy, the devil, will come in and sow terrors amongst them. So this is the devil's activity right from the very beginning uh, to corrupt the gospel, but not corrupt the gospel necessarily with um, uh, very weird or strange teachings, you know, uh, but uh, crafty uh, teachings, teachings that would uh, uh, professedly come from the Bible itself, in, even indeed from Moses. In other words, bringing religion in to, to undermine the actual gospel of God's grace. And so this was the methodology of the enemy right from the beginning, and it still is today. And so in the, in the, uh, the um, idea, or I shouldn't say the idea, but the circumstances or the situation of the Galatians uh, it was the fact of circumcision, that uh, you, you must be circumcised because Moses commanded circumcision. Abraham was circumcised, and so they drew it from the Old Testament scriptures uh, that in order to be saved, you must also be circumcised and keep the law of Moses and all that was connected with it. So in this uh, epistle, short epistle, Paul, someone has said Paul expounded the true gospel, he exposed the false gospel, and he excoriated the teachers of the false gospel. And one of the other striking features here is that um, 
how abrupt Paul is. And you might say even harsh. He was uh, very strong on this. Whereas when you think of the epistle to the Corinthians, for example, where uh, there was a lot of issues amongst the Corinthian Christians. There was worldliness, carnality, uh, fornication, and all of these types of things that Paul's heart and his emotions was were very uh, on a sleeve toward them. And, and he, he introduces himself very gently to them and uh, affectionately to them and shows what uh, good gifts that God had given them and um, all of these things. And so he, he's more gentle with the Corinthians as he graciously unfolds where they had gone wrong. Uh, but with the Galatians, he brings the hammer right down to the very beginning. Uh, it's abrupt. There's no long salutation, introduction, um, expressions of his love and kindness, and all of it. Boom, it's right off the bat. And we should take this to heart because we sort of look things from another way than the Apostle Paul. Often, if a Christian falls into moral sin, we're shocked. And we feel that we need to react and something needs to be done and and we shun them and put aside put them aside quickly. But when it comes to false doctrine or false teaching from the Word of God, we tend to have some grace to go along with it. We we tend to be not as shocked, let's put it that way, not as harsh toward it, uh, than we are to say moral sin. But the apostle is the other way around. With Paul, it's not that he turned a blind eye to moral sin. Of course, he deals with it. And even towards the end of the Corinthian epistle, he, he's quite hard towards those who were continuing on in sin. But but it's just his presentation, I should say, his, his approach in dealing with it was different than when it came to straight out undermining his apostleship, undermining uh, the, the, the doctrine of the grace of God. That's how really important it is. Uh, false teaching... Uh, will always produce bad fruit. And it's a dishonor to the Lord Jesus and to his finished work. Okay, a couple other points here uh, is that with these false teachers who came in and uh, told the Galatians, you know, uh, yeah, you believe in Jesus, but you need to also be circumcised. There's three points that we want to see about these false teachers. One, the false teachers did not deny that Jesus was the Messiah. Let's keep that before our minds. The false teachers did not deny that Jesus was the Messiah. The second point is the false teachers uh, believed the Bible, or at least they believed the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't really written yet, but uh, it was only beginning in the process of being written. Uh, Galatians is actually one of the earlier epistles. Uh, but they believed the Old Testament scriptures. They, they, they used the Old Testament scriptures indeed to undermine Paul's uh, teaching of the gospel of the grace of God. So the false teachers did not deny that Jesus was the Messiah. The false teachers uh, believed the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. And also the third point is the false gospels were zealous. Uh, the false, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the false teachers of, of, of the gospel, of, of this um, false gospel that they were presenting, were zealous and religious. They were zealous to, to gain followers for their viewpoint. Three things. They believe that Jesus is Messiah, they believe in the Old Testament, and they're very religious and zealous. And so we see that today, too. There are uh, professed Christian groups, and uh, uh, or some more on the fringes of Christianity as well, that um, certainly believe that Jesus is Lord, uh, that uh, they're zealous for the truth, or what they conceive to be the truth. Uh, they, believe the, they believe the Bible. But anything that brings in in addition to the gospel, for example, lordship salvation, I would put in that category, lordship salvation. In other words, a, a submission, a, a certain quantum of obedience before uh, one can be saved. That's not the gospel. Obedience follows the gospel, but does not precede it. And I know that they, they protest against that, uh, that uh, characterization of their doctrine. But really, when you come right down to it, that's what it is. I can't take the time to to go into it, but uh, that's what it is. If you're interested, I wrote a book called Lordship, Salvation, and the Assurance of the Believer. You can get it through Believer's Bookshop. You may find it helpful uh, in looking at that uh, that issue. 
another thing here too is the solemnity, solemnity of this is that the apostle gives a double anathema. An anathema is a curse. Okay, so in verse 6 he says, I marvel that you so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of of Christ unto another gospel, uh, which is not another, uh, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he says in verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel uh, to you other than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. But then he says it again. He says in verse 9, As we said before, so I say now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you that, uh, than that you have already received, let him be a curse. So it's a, a double anathema, a double curse. So this is really, really strong. And this shows the, uh, where the apostle's heart was in this matter. To touch uh, the gospel of grace, to tamper with the gospel of grace uh, is so solemn. Uh, because the Lord Jesus died on the cross, shed his precious blood, suffered under the hand of a righteous God. Uh, the sinless one was made sin so we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And in believing in this and putting our trust upon this, we are saved. right? And not adding uh, Sabbath, circumcision, uh, certain quantums of obedience, all of these things uh, that are additions to the gospel of grace. Uh, the salvation is of the Lord. It's of a sovereign grace. It's the work of God in the soul. Sure, fruits uh, should appear. And there should be some evidence of conversion. And if there's true conversion, there will be obedience. There will be a, a pursuing, a going on, for sure. Uh, positive of it. Uh, but that follows salvation is not part of salvation or preceding salvation. Justification and sanctification, practical sanctification, we have to keep that line of demarcation there between them. There's a connection, yet they are distinct. Okay, there's a connection, yet they are distinct. So we want to uh, hold on to that uh, and not let that go. Um, another thing here to, uh, also, uh, how quickly the Galatians went into this error. You see in verse 6, marvel that you are so soon removed uh, from the gospel, from the grace of him that calls you under another gospel. And, you know, this is the characterization of, of mankind in a way. Whatever position man was set in in grace, he quickly departs from it. Whether Adam in the garden or even Noah in the new world, he, he immediately falls into drunkenness. Or when the priesthood was established, you know, um, the, sons, two, the sons of Aaron, you know, they offered strange fire and, and so on and so on. Uh, that we quickly mar what God has given us in grace. You know, in Psalm 106, verse 13, uh, in, in Psalm 106, uh, the psalmist describes the history of Israel, how they were brought out of Egypt, you know, brought into the wilderness. Um, the Lord delivered them from Egypt. But then it says in verse 13, once they got into the wilderness, uh, they soon forgot his works. Uh, they waited not for his counsel. That's Psalm 106, verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. So uh, let us pursue on. Let us not give up. Let us maintain the gospel of the God's grace uh, and, and um, not in any way uh, hinder the grace of God, try to undermine it with uh, putting uh, other things, attaching other things to it and not to take away from it. And then the Apostle Paul concludes this with that doxology Verse 5 of chapter 1, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Why glory forever and ever? Amen. Because he died to deliver us from this present evil age. And it is an evil age, friends. Uh, the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 7, uh, The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it, that its works thereof are evil. But the Lord died for us to deliver, to deliver us from this present evil age. He shed his precious blood for us. Let's lay hold of that. Let's not undermine that. Let us confess that. For to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.